Ever wonder how westerns show endless freedom and vast landscapes? Scorsese's Killers of the Flower Moon flips that. Instead of wide open plains, we see oil rigs and a dark web of violence and conspiracy. This movie isn't your grandpa's western, it's a stark contrast that makes you think. Now, if you've read David Grand's book that the film is based on, you'll remember that it's all about a series of unsolved murders that plagued the Osage people back in the 1920s. It's a deep dive into these crimes, the birth of the FBI, and how J. Edgar Hoover used this case to shape the Bureau. It's suspenseful, and it's all about the investigation, but Scorsese, well, he takes a different route. Scorsese's Killers of the Flower Moon isn't your typical murder mystery. Through his lens, we witness the descent of ordinary people into darkness, driven by greed, complicity and cowardice. The film's a gut punch, unflinchingly portraying brazen killings for financial gain. With power and political influence on the side of the perpetrators, it's a stark reminder of America's original sin, the mistreatment of native populations. At its heart is Molly Burkhart, played brilliantly by native actress Lily Gladstone. She embodies innocent love and ferocious anger, holding her own against heavyweights like De Niro and DiCaprio, who portray men with a warm benevolence masking an icy chill. Scorsese crafts a subversive murder mystery that doesn't leave you wondering what it is, but rather forces you to confront a bigger, uncomfortable question. Just how far are people willing to go for greed? The films are studying contrasts between old westerns and new, between the book and the film, between the warmth of the characters and their cold-blooded actions. These contrasts make the film compelling and thought-provoking. Scorsese doesn't provide easy answers or neat conclusions, instead he does what he does best, making us think, making us uncomfortable, and forcing us to confront the darker side of human nature. It's one of Scorsese's most brutal films, but also one of his most thoughtful and self-reflective leaving a lasting impact on viewers. In the heartland of Oklahoma, Asaji elders conducted a solemn ritual, burying a ceremonial pipe and tying themselves to their ancestors and land. Their world was about to shift dramatically as oil bubbled up from their lands, making the Asaji nation the richest per capita overnight. However, this wealth came with a dark side. The US Congress deemed the Asaji incapable of managing their newfound riches and appointed guardians to control their money. Meanwhile, Ernest Burkhart, a young World War I veteran, arrived in Oklahoma and was introduced to William King Hale, the king of the Asagi Hills. King, a charismatic businessman and deputy sheriff, took a liking to Ernest and encouraged him to learn about Asagi culture. Beneath the surface of this newfound prosperity, a sinister trend emerged. Asagi people started turning up dead and their deaths were often ruled as suicides with minimal investigation. Among them was Molly Carl, a full-blood Asaji woman who found herself blocked from her own money, even for a diabetes medicine without her guardian's approval. Ernest, now working as a cab driver, met Molly when she became a regular customer. King saw an opportunity and nudged Ernest to pursue a romance with her. Despite initial hesitation, Ernest found himself drawn to Molly's strength and spirit. Their bond deepened, culminating in a traditional Asaji wedding. Amidst the celebration, King consoled a grieving Asaji woman who soon passed away, casting a pall over the festivities and serving as a grim reminder of the shadows lurking behind the Asaji nation's wealth. Little did they know, the storm was just beginning to gather force. Tension and grief hung heavy in the air, Molly Carl, already burdened by a family's wealth and imposed guardianship, was about to face a devastating storm. The once peaceful community was now plagued by mysterious murders, leaving families broken and questions unanswered. Molly's world began to crumble when her mother Lizzie saw an owl outside the window, a harbinger of death. She believed, brought on by Molly's marriage to Ernest Burkhart, a white man. Lizzie's words stung and her favouritism for Molly's sister Anna was a fresh wound. Chaos erupted when a drunken Anna, enraged, grabbed a gun during an argument with Ernest's brother Byron. The rooms filled with Anna's fury, Molly's desperation, and Ernest's swift action to defuse the situation. The next day brought a fragile peace with Anna and Byron reconciling before departing. Unbeknownst to Molly, this was their last encounter. News of Anna's murder shattered the community, and Molly grappled with unbearable loss. Another Asaji man was found dead the same day, both ruled as murders, sparking fear and anger. Determined to find justice, Molly offered a reward for information. King Hell, a powerful figure, supplemented the reward and encouraged tip-offs. However, a sinister web of deceit surrounded Molly. Unbeknownst to her, Ernest was monitoring her, 
feeding information to King who manipulated events from the shadows. The investigation took a dark turn when William Burns, the private detective Molly hired, vanished. Meanwhile, Molly's health deteriorated rapidly, not just from diabetes, but from poison administered by Ernest and King, aided by trusted doctors. Molly's world was shattering, caught in a web of betrayal and deceit that would change her life forever. As Molly lay weak and vulnerable, a knock at the door brought Tom White from the US Bureau of Investigation. The tribal council had sought government aid and agents were now investigating the Asaji murders. Panicked, Ernest rushed to inform King, setting off a chain of events that would unravel their twisted plot. Molly, unaware of Ernest's betrayal, was fighting for her life. Her world was about to shatter. In Asaji County's quiet corners, Ernest Burkhart was panicking. The Bureau of Investigation had arrived, the questions echoing through his home. Molly, his wife, lay resting, her body ravaged by what they thought was diabetes. Ernest, trembling, told the agent to return another day, his heart pounding. He hurried to find King, his uncle, and the puppet master of their grim scheme. King, calm as ever, was at a festival laughing and joking, oblivious to the law's watchful eyes. He advised Ernest to sit unaware of the storm brewing. The next day, King's luck seemed to have run out. His attempt to claim insurance money was denied, his influence waning. The investigation was closing in, and the once peaceful community was now a hotbed of tension. Molly, caught in the middle, was about to face the harrowing truth, her life hanging in the balance as the web of deception and manipulation began to unravel. The stage was set for a gripping tale of survival amidst the all-rich lands of Asaji County. Meanwhile, the agents dug deeper, unearthing the rotten roots of King's empire. They questioned the Shah brothers, who claimed exhuming Anna's body was merely cultural. Tom White, the lead agent, approached King, but he refused to talk, citing the inappropriateness of their meeting place. Despite Blackie, one of King's men, being caught during a bank robbery, King maintained his facade, supporting Asaji projects to keep up appearances. Fear gripped King, prompting him to tie up loose ends. AC Kirby and Henry Grammer, his accomplices, were targeted. AC died in a botched robbery, while Henry perished in a car crash. The agents, like hounds on a scent, focused on Henry Ron's murder, their suspicions growing daily. Ernest, feeling the noose tighten, grew paranoid. He tampered with Molly's insulin, adding poison, then drank contaminated alcohol, passing out after administering the deadly dose to his wife. Ernest was taken in for interrogation but remained silent until Blackie, handcuffed and desperate, advised him to confess to save his family. Tom White, seeing Ernest's vulnerability, persuaded him to open up. Eager to see Molly again, Ernest finally relented, his secrets spilling out under the weight of his guilt. Molly, meanwhile, was on the brink of death, her body weakened by the poison. She was rushed to the hospital, her life hanging by a thread. King, sensing his downfall, surrendered but maintained his innocence. Ernest, in a car with Tom White, was offered a deal. Testify against King, and he wouldn't be charged. As Molly fought for a life, King's empire crumbled, and the truth of his crimes laid bare for all to see. The trials commenced, a spectacle filled with echoing testimonies. Molly attended her eyes, reflecting anger and sorrow. Ernest confessed everything implicating King as the mastermind behind the Asaji murders. Despite admitting his role, Ernest insisted his love for Molly was genuine. Molly confronted him about the poisoning, but he denied it, creating a rift between them. The Shah brothers, suspected of providing the poison, evaded prosecution due to insufficient evidence. Byron walked free due to a hung jury. King, though claiming innocence, received a life sentence, but was later released through bribes and political favours. Ernest also received a life sentence, but was eventually pardoned. He returned to Asaji County, living in a trailer park with his brother. Molly divorced Ernest and remarried, but her happiness was brief. She passed away from diabetes at 50, laid to rest beside her family. The storm in Asaji County left a trail of destruction, a haunting tale of greed, betrayal and the pursuit of justice. Can you believe how deep the greed and betrayal ran in Asaji County? The storm left a trail of destruction, and Molly's story is a haunting reminder of the fight for justice. If you found this tale as compelling as we did, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Hit the bell icon to get notifications for more stories like this. Thanks for watching.